When you think of monk, you must think of using your fist, right? But what if I told you there is a way to play monk that is a hybrid between weapon damage and fist damage becoming a true assassin? Hey everyone, I'm Ronan, and thank you tuning in for another Baldur's Gate 3 video. Today is all about the Shadow Assassin Monk, but before we break it down, I do want to say thank you to everyone that votes on these kind of build videos. I really appreciate it a lot, and the channel has grown significantly. I reached 2.5 million total views on the channel now, so thank you so much to everyone who tunes in. Because of you, my channel is starting to grow a lot more than I anticipated, and I really appreciate you. The Shadow Assassin Monk is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's part monk, part rogue, specifically the assassin subclass. And at first glance, you can probably think of what this will play like, but I think with the way I do gear, beats, and some other things, it may play a little differently than you might suspect. Either way though, I think it's really fun to shadow teleport, open up on someone, pretty much one shot an enemy. And most of the time, depending on how you play, the other enemies may not even detect you either, which is really fantastic. It's a great way to open up in honor mode and completely nullify at least one target at the start of combat. I love monks, and I also like being that kind of like stealthy type character at the same time. So this is a great combination of both. If you're new here, comment down below what you want to see next. Suicide Squash, thank you so much for being a member of my channel. If you guys would like to get shadows like they do and some additional perks for my live streams, hit join down below. Let's go ahead and break this video down. One thing unique about Monk is the fact that you actually have martial arts scaling. What this means is every few levels, your fist attacks will scale in damage 1d4 to 1d6, all the way up to 1d8 starting at level 9. This will also affect weapons. Any weapon you are proficient in, excluding two-handed only weapons, will actually scale with your martial arts level. So at monk level 9, daggers and short swords that would normally scale with less damage will now scale for 1d8 damage plus their modifier. This is important to know with how we talk about gearing later on. Quick disclaimer when it comes to origin characters or race, there are two extremely powerful origin characters I would highly recommend for this build. Asterion is a great pick if you decide to ascend him in act 3. Once he gets ascended, he will have another D10 necrotic damage added to every single melee hit with his fist or weapon attacks, making him one of the strongest hitters in the game. Another very solid option is to be the Dark Urge. The Dark Urge will actually have a unique cape you can get in game that will allow you to go invisible once per turn after killing an enemy. With the way this build works, this is extremely powerful and extremely game breaking. For this build, your starting stats and the only two feats you need are on screen now. Your first feat will be Tavern Brawler, going a point into Constitution to give you 16, having a plus 4 modifier. And we went Athlete to get Dexterity to 18, giving you a plus 4 Dex modifier. And with gear that we'll talk about later on, you will have max Dexterity at 20. And don't worry, for those that are worried about using Elixir of Hill Giant Strength, you do not need to do that in order to gain the benefit of Tavern Brawler, and I'll talk about why in a little bit. But for now, just know these are my two feats and my starting sets that I went. Skill proficiency wise, go with Stealth if you are able to pick it because Stealth is going to be pretty important about this later on when we talk about how to go about your playstyle. This is a 9 level Shadow Monk and 3 level Assassin Multiclass. I like leveling levels 1 to 6 via Shadow Monk three levels in a row to get assassin and then my final three levels into monk. Probably the most appealing aspect of this build is shadow step that you unlock at level six. This is a great way to go from one darkness area to another while providing automatic advantage on your next melee attack roll, which is a great way to set up auto sneak attack damage for your next attack, even when using flurry of blows, assuming you are using a main hand finesse weapon. Combine that with the 100% chance to crit that the assassin provides you and you have a devastating combo. As a shadow monk, you will gain some really cool additional features like minor illusion being able to be cast while being stealth or silenced and it will not break stealth or silence. But my all time favorite combo is actually shadow arts pass without a trace. If you combo this along with another caster to give you greater invisibility, you can pretty much guarantee you will always attack 
and not break stealth, enemies will have no idea what is even going on or what's attacking them. The best part about this build is the fact that you can pretty much use any gear you want from the start of the game to the end and it will all do pretty well. The only required two pieces in my opinion will be the graceful cloth in order to get your dexterity to 20. This will also give you cat's grace giving you advantage on all dexterity based skills including stealth checks. Club at Hill Giant Strength would be your offhand weapon for majority of the game until you get to Act 3. This is because this will give you Strength to 19, giving you a plus 4 modifier, which is how you get the extra damage from Tavern Brawler. This is really nice because Monk's weapons scale with your martial arts, so weapons like the Cersor Dagger that have a chance to silence your enemy will actually be even more powerful because that 1d4 damage can scale all the way up to 1d8 as you get more levels into monk but what if we wanted even more damage well i do have a way to optimize it even more and i'll go into more detail about gearing in a second but know for now if you combo the amorous dagger in your offhand with either the sword of life stealing in your main hand or the legendary short sword in your main hand that plus seven additional damage for crit damage that the amorous provides will be affected for your main hand weapon this will also affect your bow. This will affect the plus 10 necrotic damage you see here. This will affect the plus seven piercing damage. This will affect sneak attack damage. And because sneak attack damage can be auto applied, you can get the additional plus 17 necrotic damage to be applied twice, making that plus seven damage from the Amoris in your offhand actually be applied three times. It'll be applied to sneak attack damage, It'll be applied to the necrotic damage and it will be applied to your main hand weapon attack damage as well making it one of the best off hands to combine with an assassin for the auto crit chance and in case it wasn't clear although we are dual wielding you will hardly ever attack with your off hand weapon that is because monks have the ability to actually attack with their fists as a bonus action and you'll see this in the bottom right hand side of your character's like little like attack area you can use that to attack with your fist using a bonus action after attacking with your main hand weapon or use your bonus action and a key point to use flurry of blows. And one final thing before we actually get into gearing and then showcasing multiple combat scenarios, I do want to state one thing I really like is the fact that you can go like completely invisible during combat and completely reset assuming you're the only character in combat at the moment and then open up again on the enemy for another assassin round surprise, essentially making you a one-man killing machine. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to talk gear. I want you to pay attention. For the most part, things are pretty simple to understand. If you didn't see the breakdown, definitely watch it because it explains it pretty well, but your weapons here are extremely important with this build. Monks have a cool martial arts scaling meaning every few levels they will gain increased fist damage up to a maximum of 1d8 but that damage also increases martial arts weapons or monk weapons that you have so short swords daggers gloves things like that that damage will all scale with your martial arts with this build because we have nine monk levels our martial arts die is considered 1d8 so all attacks that are considered fist weapons will do 1d8 damage all weapon attacks that are monk weapons will also scale to be 1d8. This is important because daggers, for example, that are normally 1d4 are now 1d8. Short swords that are normally 1d6 are now 1d8. And this is when you can min-max to an extreme extent and have some insane damage combos. So starting out, if you don't want to min-max and you just want to equip some gear and do some really good damage regardless, my go-to weapons would be your main hand weapon, Sword of Life Stealing. This is great because on crit you do plus 10 necrotic damage. Because we are part assassin, we get those auto crits, right? So it's automatically another plus 10 necrotic on that. Plus you get the extra 1d8 damage as well. The extra cold comes from me using the Drake Throat Glaive to buff it. And then the 1d4 psychic you see is a, from a ring we'll talk about in a minute. Our offhand is going to be Club A Whole Giant Strength because we did take Tavern Brawler. We want to add additional damage to fist attacks that's equal to our strength modifier. 
So this will automatically set your strength to 19, which is why we don't take any strength at the start of the game. This is fantastic. You get this really early in Act 1. So no matter what, your fist attacks with this are going to be pretty dang solid. Now here's when things get really min maxi and to the point where you do some broken damage with this in my opinion. So you have a weapon here called Dolor Amoris if I said that correctly. You, there are two ways to obtain this. If you want to become a cultist of Ball, you can buy it from the vendor or during the tribunal murders quest there is a dwarf that I'll pop up on screen now. When you kill him he actually drops this dagger. And this dagger is insane. It says when you land a critical hit with this weapon, it deals an additional 7 damage. I don't know if it's a tooltip error or a bug, but this will affect any damage from your bow and it will affect crit damage from your weapon. So this is when things really get warped here because our weapon we talked about does another D10 necrotic damage, right? And because we are part rogue, we get sneak attack damage too. Well, the plus 7 damage from this, this will affect sneak attack damage, it will affect necrotic damage, and it will affect the normal 1d8 piercing as well. So if you crit and have your sneak attack be automatic like I have here, when you crit, you will do plus 21 damage on top of all the other damage you would normally do from the crit is very, very powerful in such a killer combo since you get those automatic crits early on. In order to do that though and utilize this, you will have to use Elixir of Hill Giant Strength if you want your fist attacks to still be decent. If you don't want to use this Elixir, then you will be stuck using the Club of Hill Giant Strength. You will still do solid damage, but if you want to ramp that damage up even higher, the elixir in combination with this dagger is the way to go. Now, we are an assassin, so we want as much initiative as we possibly can have. Another great way to do that is to utilize the bow you see on screen now, the Hell Rider Longbow. I rarely use this for damage. When I do attack with this, it's mainly to use Arrows of Darkness. We can shadow step to dark areas. This is a great way to get darkness on the ground without utilizing the spell itself and wasting key. And if you do attack with this, you have a chance to proc fairy fire on the enemy. But the main reason we use it is for the extra initiative and advantage on perception ability checks. Our cloak, I like going cloak of displacement here. Feel free to use something else like cloak of protection if you really wanted. I think close it, the, the displacement cloak is the best cloak for this build. You are a little squishy. I have just under 100 HP and my AC is only 18, so I'm a little squishy with this build, which is why having the enemies have disadvantage on their attack rolls against me is pretty dang useful. My chest piece is the Graceful Cloth. There is no workaround. This is the chest piece you will utilize as soon as you get it. The only exception to that is if you use the Hag's Hair. I'm not using the Hag's Hair for this build. My two feats were to get my Dexterity to 18 and then also Tavern Brawler. So because of that, this is what gets my dexterity to 20. My gloves, I like the Helldust gloves or inside Act 2 you can get the Flawed Helldust gloves which are very similar, just not quite as strong. The reason for that is this is a mixed build. You use some melee, you use some weapon attacks. This will give you fire damage for your weapon attacks, your melee like your fist attacks will do necrotic damage and can inflict bleeding which is really really dang cool and the Upgraded version has Rays of Fire, which if you open up with this, it's because you're an assassin, every single hit from this will be a crit. Your boots, there is no workaround. If you want the maximum fist damage, you have to use Boots of Kushigo. If you would rather have extra armor class and saving throws, you could use the Bone Spike Boots. This will also give you a cool ability, Brutal Leap, you can use once per turn with a bonus action. It does a little bit of damage and knocks the enemies prone. You can see with this, my jump distance is insane. I have 75 feet jump distance. I can jump really far with this, but I like having the extra fist damage from the other boots instead. Now, do you guys remember that neck piece you can get inside the Grim Forge? If you follow the quest chain, you can actually upgrade it. This gives you Shatter. It says it's level two, but the upgraded version does 4d8. Normally, the downgraded version does 3d8. And the key restoration is actually upgraded as well. The blue version that you get from Grimforge only gives you two key. 
This will give you key equal to your martial arts die, which is insane because we have 1d8 for a martial art, arts die. And because we only have 10 key overall, this is a great way to recharge it. My ring is Strange Conduit Ring. The spell Pass Without a Trace, it does require two key to use, but it gives you plus 10 stealth until your next long rest. And you should always be utilizing this spell in order to gain the additional 1d4 psychic pretty much at all times for your weapon attacks. Now the other ring, I went with the Eversight Ring here so I won't be blinded. The reason for this is you do have the darkness spell, which is great. It is a concentration, but you can utilize it. Or you can utilize the arrows of darkness to set up darkness as well. Because you are a shadow monk, you have the cool ability to shadow step in the shadows. So it's a great way to set up areas for you to shadow step to. So for my helms, I like using the Diadem of Arcane Synergy. You inflict so many conditions with this build between stunning them between knocking them prone, all kinds of different things you can do with this build. You will proc this all the time for an extra plus three damage to all melee hits with weapons, not fist. If you wanna have a mix, Horns of the Berserker is really nice. Unarmed, meaning your fist and melee attacks with weapons will do additional two necrotic damage, but you can't be at full health. The downside is if you don't do any damage that turn, you take necrotic damage. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword in that way, but it's still nice if you want even more damage. And if you want more initiative to stack with the bow here, by equipping this helm, the Mask of Soul Perception that you get in Act 3 from the vendor, you get another plus 2 to attack rolls, initiative, and perception checks. So with this, I will have, if you take a look, plus 10 initiative, which is pretty dang cool. And because I'm a monk, I have plus 50 movement speed which is insane. I can go extremely far and that's without long strider. This will stack with long strider. So some other early items you can use. I already talked about the flawed hell dust gloves, but you also have the sparkle hands that you can use really early on inside act one. You have the knife of the undermountain king, though I do think as an assassin, instead of being a thief, that the sword of light stealing is a little bit better. And of course, bows, feel free to change this out for anything else you want, but initiative is pretty dang important for this build. Alright guys, for this combat showcase here, I am going to showcase it two different ways. I'm going to showcase combat using the Club of Hill Giant Strength without using the Elixir. Then afterwards, I will showcase the extra damage you can do by min-maxing with the potion and this dagger in my offhand. So one thing that's really cool about the monk as a Shadow Monk specifically, it's the fact that you get Shadow Step, being able to go back and forth between the enemies. I explained this a little bit in the breakdown, but just in case you missed it, Shadow Stepping will give me advantage for my next attack. Another thing you can do as well, you can simply just use Cloak of Shadows right away. This will put me in stealth. But you can see, I'm not hiding. So one thing you would like to do with Cloak of Shadows, because if you see I go hiding, now it goes away. Because I'm already hiding, if I use Cloak of Shadows, I will remain hidden. You can see I have Cloak of Shadows plus the Hiding debuff as well. If I go into the light, however, look what happens. It goes away, which is why making sure you're in a dark area is important, which is why I would really recommend you go ahead and get as many dark arrows as possible or get used to using Shadow Arts Darkness. All right, so let's go ahead with that being said, open up. I already have Shadow Arts Pass Without a Trace already on, which is like that shadowy aura around me in order to get the Strange Conduit Ring procced. All right, now one thing I always want you to do, always have another character cast haste on you or make sure you have plenty of speed potions because you do the maximum damage on your openers, you want to get as many critical strikes as you possibly can. So I'm going to open up with Flurry of Blows on this enemy in front of us. You can see they are all surprised. I rolled pretty well for my initiative, so I go first. He's already almost dead and he's bleeding. Instead, I'm going to come over here and just attack her. That's a lot of damage. And you can see, real quick, I do want to showcase here. 
So for my damage, I have the 23 piercing, the cold, fire, and psychic. That's all from my gear. I have the additional 10 necrotic damage because of the weapon I'm using. Sword of the Life Stealing. But you can see it proc twice. The reason to proc twice is because my sneak attack damage, I had it set to auto. Right here, I have it checked but not asked, so it will automatically proc when I have advantage. Because of that, it actually procs the extra necrotic damage twice, which is really powerful. And this isn't even the min-max build. So now I did that, my sneak attack is gone. I will no longer have sneak attack for this round. But instead, I do have plenty of more actions I can do to kill the enemy. So let's go ahead and attack him. Did some good damage. So for my follow-up action, I could use my unarmed strike offhand to attack him this way, which would kill him. But I don't want to do that yet. Instead, let's go ahead and just attack him normally. Did some even better damage there. And for this guy here, we're going to go ahead and punch him. He should die from this. He's gone. And I still have one more attack that we're going to use on this character up here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and end my turn. Because they were surprised, it skips their turn. And I want to show you something that is really fun to do in case you're ever in a pinch. So one thing you can do, ignore that I have two actions here because I did use a speed potion. Instead, I'm going to use Flurry of Blows. And these are going to be non-crit. And I actually missed on one of them, which is a little unfortunate. But maybe you need to get out. Like, maybe you have to get away. Well, that's when your ability here, Cloak of Shadows, is really useful. Because now, I can get away pretty much no problem. And because I have such high movement, I can go really dang far. Alright guys, so for this part of the combat showcase, you can see my strength is substantially lower since I do have the dagger in my offhand now. So to make up for not having the Club of Hill Giant Strength, we are going to use the potion here in order to get the plus 5 modifier. So we're going to open up, and I do have everything else the same except for my helm. I'm using the Diadem of Arcane Synergy here. So it's just like before, I'm going to hide, open up with Cloak of Shadows, go ahead and Shadow Step behind the enemy. And I'm not even going to bother with using my... Ace potion here because I don't really think it's needed. All right, you can see they're all surprised. I almost one shot him, which is nice, and those were non crit. Now, I'm going to do so much damage here. I'm probably going to one shot all these characters. Let's start with him since he has a little bit more beefy HP. Now, that was a lot of damage. You can see I got the extra temporary hit points. And if you take a look at my damage now compared to before, and I'll have the before damage on screen for you to see now. But essentially, if we take a look, you have the 24 piercing. And you can see plus 7 from the weapon. The necrotic plus 7 from the weapon. The piercing damage, which is my sneak attack, plus 7 from my offhand dagger. And then the life stealing, like the chronic damage, procced again because of my sneak attack, which also had another plus seven damage. That is a lot of extra damage just from having the dagger there. So he's gone. Bye bye. So let's go ahead and open up on this character in front of us. We'll go ahead and just punch her. He's gone. And the guy we attacked earlier, we're going to finish off right here. He's gone. So you can see you do a ton of damage with this build. So I'm going to end my turn and showcase the trick I tried showcasing a little bit earlier. So you can maybe understand it a little bit better. So let's go ahead and open up on this target here. Oh, I missed my initial hit. I'm really surprised. So we'll go ahead and use Cloak of Shadows. And I'm going to run away. I'm going to go all the way over here. I'm just going to end my turn. They're going to try to find me and they're not going to be able to. And guess what? Combat's over. So let's go ahead and jump behind this character here. 
And guess what we're going to do now? That's right. We're going to open up on this guy again. All right. And guess what? I surprised them once again, which is really dang cool. So what I'm going to do now, we're going to go ahead and attack this enemy here. One shot her. Oh, I didn't one shot her. I rolled pretty low. That's okay. You got the idea what I'm doing. So now what I can end up doing for my bonus action, let's go ahead and teleport to the ranger. Let's go right over here and pretend this isn't here. Like if that's not there, I could shoot an arrow or darkness and teleport that way as well. But there is cover here, which is why I'm going to do that way. And then we'll come over to the ranger and attack him instead. But you guys can understand how this build works. I absolutely love this build. I love monks and I also love like the stealthy type kind of gameplay. So this was a nice like mix in between and I thought it was really fun. Technically, if you wanted to, you could become a cultist of ball and get the ball armor for even more damage. But I really don't think it's necessary with this build and a lot of people don't want to be evil anyway. So I thought this was a great way to still get some really great damage without being evil. And most of the gear you get is really early on, in my opinion. So anyway, guys, I'm Ronan. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, like and comment down below. Let me know what you guys want to see next. And I will see you all in the next one. Bye bye.